started out as a bad answers video, but I very quickly realized we needed to make it full length. Chantilly Clad submitted the question, why can't you go faster than the speed of light? Short answer, you just can't. Them's the rules. Today, we're going to be talking about Einstein's theory of special relativity. And I'm going to be introducing a bit of math today, but we'll go slowly. Welcome to Bad Astra. Fine, let's get some science content. Why? We need to talk about polyamory. Remember when Pluto was demoted to dwarf planet? It's okay, man. We all make mistakes. Ah! Isn't physics fun? Is this being recorded? Part one. Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. We've all heard of this equation, and I'm going to quickly refresh what it means conceptually. Energy equals mass times the speed of light, or c, squared. The speed of light in a vacuum is a known constant at 300,000 kilometers per second. This equation implies that energy and mass are interchangeable, since to change between the two, one needs only to divide or multiply by 90 billion kilometers per second squared, which is totally something you should learn to calculate in your head. It's not like we carry calculators in our pockets every single day for these kinds of equations, Mr. Price. The equation also implies that converting mass into energy would release an incredible amount of energy which happens to be how nuclear bombs work. The products of a uranium fission or hydrogen fusion reaction weigh ever so slightly less than the original atoms. And that difference is made up by releasing energy enough to power or level a city. This equation also implies that the more energy an object has, the more mass it has. So the thicker you are, the more energy you have as a projectile, which is just straight up scientific fact. Mass equals energy divided by the speed of light squared. So more energy equals more mass. Kinetic energy is determined by resting mass and speed. And special relativity actually has an equation for relativistic mass. Mass equals resting mass divided by the square root of one minus velocity squared over the speed of light squared. It's time for some hardcore math content so buckle up. At rest, or v equals zero, the mass is just the resting mass divided by one, or the resting mass. At half the speed of light, the mass is equal to resting mass divided by the square root of one minus a half squared, which is resting mass divided by one minus 0.25, which equals resting mass divided by the square root of 0.75, or mass equals resting mass times 1.155. So as we approach the speed of light, you can see that the mass is increasing. Let's go all the way up to 90% of the speed of light, where mass equals resting mass divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.9 squared, which equals resting mass divided by square root of 1 minus 0.81, which is resting mass divided by the square root of 0.19, which is equal to resting mass times 2.294. So at 90% of the speed of light, the mass of an object has almost doubled. When we get all the way up to 99% of the speed of light, mass is equal to resting mass divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.99 squared, which is resting mass divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.98, which is resting mass divided by the square root of 0.02, which is resting mass times 7.089. Now, when we get to the speed of light, we run into issues. Mass equals resting mass divided by the square root of one minus one squared, which is resting mass divided by the square root of one minus one, which is resting mass divided by the square root of zero, which is resting mass times infinity. So to travel at the speed of light, you need enough fuel to multiply your own mass by infinity, which, good luck. To travel faster than the speed of light, you need to take the square root of a negative number, which is as imaginary as warp drive.
<laughs> yes, I know it's a tautology. I can't prove why the laws of physics are the way they are. So I'm trying to illustrate our mathematical understanding. Yes, I know that wasn't the question, but it's what I've got. Stop giving me that look. So what about photons? They travel at the speed of light just fine because they are, well, light. Photons use a sneaky trick called not weighing anything. Zero divided by zero, or zero times infinity, is still zero, so they can travel at the speed of light. However, even massless particles can't take the square root of a negative number in real life, so they can't go any faster. Other massless particles also travel at the speed of light, but photons were the first to be observed by our, you know, human eyes. Again, dogs are not in charge of scientific research because they lack opposable thumbs. So calling it the speed of light is correct, but incomplete. It's really the cosmic speed limit, which photons, among other massless particles, obey but push the upper limit on, would be a more complete definition. But that's not as catchy, so let's keep the current name. So if you're massless, you could potentially travel at the speed of light, like a ghost. But this is more metaphysics and philosophy, so Eris will address that in a different video. In fact, massless particles like photons always travel at the speed of light. They just can't stop, won't stop. They can be absorbed, emitted, or even scattered, but they can never be relaxed. They are pure energy, like Hammy the Squirrel. I am a crazy rabbit squirrel. I want my cookie! Part two, fun with frames. Have you ever heard the term, everything is relative? This is mostly true. Position, distance, morality, and usually speed are. Pop quiz. If I'm traveling down the highway in my car at 70 miles per hour, I'll use the imperial system just this once, USA, and throw a 30 mile per hour pitch forwards at someone on the side of the road, how much time will the person standing a tenth of a mile away have to move to avoid being hit by my major league pitch? Leave a comment down below with your answer, nerds. However, when you approach the cosmic speed limit, that changes. If you were traveling in the Enterprise at half the speed of light and turned on your high beams, you would see the light beam traveling away from you at the speed of light. However, the cloaked Klingon ship at rest would not see a beam of light traveling at one and a half times the speed of light. They'd see your ship traveling at half the speed of light and the light beam traveling at the normal cosmic speed limit. So... What? How can you both be seeing the light traveling at the same speed when you're in completely different frames of motion? Length contraction and time dilation. To explain time dilation and length contraction, the interconnected results of light speed being equal in all frames, let's look at a real world and not fictionalized example. Say the Starship Enterprise is traveling along at half impulse or half the speed of light. I think. Never mind. Anyways, the Enterprise is speeding along, but unbeknownst to the crew, they're passing right by a cloaked Klingon ship. The Klingons are stationary, just chilling. All of a sudden, seven signals appear in the galaxy. No, that's too silly. Let's say there are two signals, and we'll call them A and B, because I spent this episode's creativity budget on the artist and they're equidistant from the Federation and Klingon ships. This is a thought experiment, so we're making things super simple. From the Klingon sensor's perspective, light beams from both signals are traveling at the speed of light. And since they're the same distance away from the bird of prey, the Klingons conclude that the signals appeared simultaneously. Now let's check in with Pike or Picard or Kirk, whoever your favorite Enterprise captain is, I won't dictate your fan fiction. Because the ship is traveling at half the speed of light towards signal B, the light from signal B has less distance to travel than the light from signal A, so it reaches the ship's sensors sooner. To the crew, the light from both signals was traveling at the speed of light and coming from the same distance away. The crew of the Enterprise conclude that signal B occurred before signal A. So, which ship was right? In this case, both crews are living their truth. 
because simultaneity is relative. Time is dependent on your frame of reference. This is not why time flies sometimes and drags other. That's just your brain being a diva. And 2020 has made a pretty impressive time soup that manages to both be just a week long and like 10 years. Astrophysicists can actually observe the effects of length contraction and time dilation. One example of this is muon decay. When a cosmic ray from space crashes into a particle in the upper atmosphere, the violent collision produces a shower of smaller particles, or shrapnel. Some of this shrapnel is muons. Muons are a tenth the mass of a proton and travel close to the speed of light, but are unstable, so they don't last very long. Like 1.56 microseconds. Go fast, die young muons, do it well. Anyways, Given the known speed and lifetime of the muons, if they are created in the upper atmosphere, they should never get close to the Earth's surface. For every million muons your astronomy balloon measures at 10 kilometers above the Earth, you'd expect 0.3 to make it to the surface of the Earth before decaying. Joke's on you and your noob math, because your ground monitor is measuring around 49,000 muons for every million your balloon saw. So in your stationary frame, the muons appear to have slowed down in time. Less time has passed for them than for you. That's the time dilation. The muon doesn't perceive time as being weird. It's 1.56 microseconds aren't up yet. It just perceives the journey as having been only two kilometers. That's length contraction. By traveling faster through space compared to us, the muons travel more slowly through time relative to us and see a very condensed version of space. Special relativity is weird to wrap your head around, but if you remember three things, one, light always travels at the same speed in every frame of reference, two, time and space are relative, and three, if you're a math teacher, don't make up dumb justifications for the homework that can be destroyed by the tech companies in just a few years. Astra out. Thank you so much for joining us here on Bad Astra. If you enjoyed watching, please like this video, leave a comment telling us what topic you'd like to see next month, and share it with everyone you know. Be sure to also subscribe and ring the notification bell so you never miss a new episode. And if you can't get enough of me, Eris, and Science Tommy, join our Patreon, where we post behind the scenes, deep dives, and other fun content. A special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who make these videos possible. Astra out.